Hey everybody, this is an intro to the Quantopian lecture series. It's mainly intended for people who are less familiar. So if you're familiar with Quantopian and the lecture series, feel free to skip ahead. Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. Our goal is to democratize quantitative finance and level Wall Street's playing field and do that by providing lots of free tools and data of the same quality that you would get if you were working as a professional on Wall Street. Our business model is to provide capital allocations to the best algorithms that have been developed on the platform. Towards this end, we've developed a lot of educational materials because we want users on the platform to be well-educated. The Quantopian lectures have been developed in collaboration with and are used for teaching by many professors at top universities around the world. We also work with industry practitioners to make sure everything is applicable and keeps up with whatever people are working on at the moment. In general, we try to teach theory and intuition through hands-on applications so that you have the code ready to go once you've learned a concept. So without further ado, let's see what's on deck today. So we're going to be talking about autoregressive models today, also known as AR models. And uh, that's le this lecture right here. And you can see the other important thing for autoregressive models is autocorrelation. There's a lot of words that kind of mean very similar things in time series analysis and quantitative finance. Autocorrelation, autoregressive, latent correlation. There's like lots of things you can kind of, they're not exactly the same concepts, but you can, you know, they all kind of fit into the same space. So, Specifically for autoregressive models, we just first want to find what that means. Well, remember a model is just a way of trying to understand how something real works. And it's a, effectively building a hypothesis about how it works into a mathematical formula, trying to model the behavior of something. So what we're saying here is an autoregressive model is a model that incorporates this knowledge of the past into the current state of a system which is kind of an intuitive thing, right? You would think that like any, a lot of processes are probably going to inf be influenced by the past, um, but it's actually kind of, you know, it's a fairly sophisticated thing to model mathematically. And a very simple example, what's known as a first order autocorrelation model for a time series is this one. It says, just read it out, that the value of X at time T is equal to, or you can think of it as being, you know, dependent on some constant. So this is kind of just a, a constant uh, mean of the series. You know, you can think of every process having some kind of base state. That's kind of the base state. Plus a coefficient times the previous value plus some noise. Every model has noise in it. So what is this saying? It's saying that the value of x at time t is dependent some amount. Well, if beta 1 were 0, it would be not dependent, but dependent some amount on previous values of the series, and specifically the last value, and no values further into the past. So that's a pretty simple concept, you know, to, to get your head around. You can imagine is a lot of processes in finance are probably going to be autocorrelated because people take information about the past and incorporate it when they're making decisions and the decisions they make drive the prices up or down so you know at, at a bare minimum price data is going to be quite autocorrelated but a lot of other data sets are as well you can kind of generalize this you can think of a model as having you know a lot of dependencies because it's not always the case that you're going to have dependence just on the last data point oftentimes you'll have dependence maybe on um, more data points into the past. And think about it, if you have dependence on the last data point and that data point has dependence on the data point before it, well, even with this simple formula, you kind of have implicit decaying dependence as you go backwards through time. And so autocorrelated series are usually thought of as having some kind of memory. They have a memory that goes back in the time series and it decays the further back you go. But you can also express more sophisticated structures such as having, you know, peaks where maybe they sample one day into the past, one week ago is also important and one month ago is also important. And, you know, you have to let your understanding of the system usually drive this because it's very easy to overfit in data mine and come up with, you know, autoregressive models that just perfectly fit your data or are just tweaked to your data but don't really mean anything. We have a lot of other 
discussion of overfitting and in lectures like the uh, overfitting lecture and in and the p hacking and multiple comparisons bias lecture. So I'll check those out if you aren't familiar with those concepts. But for now, we're not going to worry too much about these assumptions here. They're written out, and I think it's important to understand them. But for today, I, I want to get through some interesting real examples. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to simulate some data. And in this case, we're going to use an AR3 process. That's how you would notate it, which means that the current value is dependent on the past three values of the series. Okay. And you can see here, well, here's our beta array, our B. And it means that our first thing, our constant is 0. So there's no base state and no mean in this. And then we have a 0.8 dependency on the next to last thing, on t minus 1. We have a 0.1 dependency on t minus 2. And a 0.05 dependency on t minus 3. OK, so it's just encoding a little bit of memory for the last three points into the system, or well, a lot of memory for the t minus one point um, into the system. But we just define this little function to actually generate data. And we generate 10,000 points. And that's what this looks like. So the first thing I want you guys to know is autocorrelated data is spiky. This is kind of the canonical graph you'd see with spikes. And the reason it's spiky is that unlike a stationary series or unlike a non autocorrelated series that doesn't have any past dependency in itself, so in a stationary series, getting an extreme value at time t is no more likely if there was an extreme value at time t minus 1. But in an autocorrelated series, if you have an extreme value at t minus 1, it makes you more likely to get another extreme value at time t. And so as a result, it's much easier to kind of walk up to more extreme values. And as a result, you get this kind of spiky behavior where it spikes in both directions. And it also shows you basically what, what's known as fat tails, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But I, I want everybody to realize, like, don't ever try to use plots to convince yourself you're right. I've said this you know, a million times. But try to use plots to look for warnings and convince yourself you're wrong. And if you're seeing spiky data, that's oftentimes an indication that there's autocorrelation in your system. And you should really investigate that. Keep in mind, again, we're going to talk a bit about stationarity. We have a full lecture on stationarity and orders of integration and co-integration in the lecture series. And you can go check that out as well. So you know, if, if you're not as familiar with stationarity, please grab that. But we need to keep in mind tail risk here. So what we're going to do is we're going to count how many extreme points we find in this series up here and compare that to what we would expect from a normal distribution. So we're going to use a cumulative distribution function from a normal Gaussian, a standard normal, and just see how that compares. So the frequency of one standard deviation event in our data is about 0.327, so already more common than the frequency of one standard deviation events in a normal process, which is only about 16%. 33 versus 16, so it's about double. And then the frequency of two standard deviation events in a normal process, it's down to about 2 3%. But it's still at 20% in our series. That's huge. That's massive, massive difference. Three standard deviations, again, actually an order of magnitude difference now. And again, actually many orders of magnitude difference more tail events in an autocorrelated series with memory than a normal distribution. So this is why they've known as having fat tails. There's more mass in the tails of this distribution. And you know we can go ahead and check this. So this cell might take a little while to run, but hopefully it'll be, OK, we're done. We'll go ahead and check this. You'll see similar results if we run it again. But you know we can plot out here a histogram of uh, our data. And let's actually increase the bin count on this histogram. You can see here, it may be hard to tell by eye. And this is why I say, like, always you know, check for autocorrelation, always check for non stationarity. It may be hard to check by looking at this and saying, like, hmm, there's fat tails. But if you actually count, there is more mass out here in these tails compared to what you would expect in a normal distribution. Uh, and you can sanity check that yourself if you want by generating data from a normal distribution and plotting in a histogram. 
compared to this, and you'll see that it, it is not quite nearly as fat on these tails. But just keep in mind, this is what we mean by tail risk. Because everything in finance is so autocorrelated, extreme values lead to extreme values, you're much more likely to get extreme events than you are in, say, like, you know, normally distributed data or, you know, t-distributed data. So just keep in mind that it's, you know, it's a real thing, and that's why you need to account for and model autocorrelated behavior in and don't assume it doesn't exist. Another really important problem that you see with autocorrelated data is that estimations of variance are going to be wrong. And that's really important because normally when it's computed, it assumes independent sampling. And this is the definition of non-independent sampling. Each data point that you're sampling has dependence on other data points. It's not independent. And as a result as well, when you have autocorrelation, that means that there's covariance between your data points, which means that your sample size is actually lower than you think it is. So 100 data points is not n equals 100. You can't have the same degree of statistical certainty. And for those two reasons, your p-values are actually going to be wrong in the presence of autocorrelated data, because not only was your sample size going to be wrong, and therefore your p-value is going to be wrong, your estimate of variance will be wrong. And variance is used to compute confidence intervals, and confidence intervals are used to compute p-values. So just as an example of this, we'll check, but I want to really you know, drill into people that if your data is autocorrelated, you cannot trust p-values on that data, or even standard error or anything like that. You just cannot trust that. You, you have to account for that in some way, account for autocorrelation before doing anything else. So. And here, we're going to compute an unadjusted confidence interval using just standard normal confidence interval bounds on our sample. This is just a function to do that. And then this is another function which will actually check to see if our confidence interval covers the true mean of the series, which is 0. And then we'll just simulate some autocorrelated data using our function that we defined earlier. And you know we're going to do it with a mean of 0. So if confidence intervals were behaving correctly, we should see pretty good coverage, 95% coverage, actually, for a 95% confidence interval. But as you may suspect, we actually see 19% coverage. So the confidence intervals for the value of the true mean that we computed naively off of our sample contained the true mean only 19% of the time when we expected them to contain the true mean 95% of the time. So that's a huge problem. That's not even like a small like, hmm, I can correct for it later. That's just like your analysis, flat out wrong. And so that's what I'm saying. Like, autocorrelation is just a fundamentally different condition that you need to model differently. You cannot assume the normal statistical things like independently sampled data. So in practice, if you aren't kind of constructing a model which accounts for autocorrelation in some way, you're not trying to get autocorrelation out of your system in some way. It can be very difficult to correctly compute variances and therefore confidence intervals and p-values. The best bet is often doing a, a Nui West correction. There's a link here to Wikipedia to find more information on it. Also, there's some functions built into Python, like I think there's compute robust covariance matrix, which tries to do that with a Nui West correction. And we may release some lectures that have more info on it. But in practice, just know about the Nui West correction, which tries to compute a better estimate of, of variance by kind of estimating the amount of autocorrelation in the data and then computing a better estimate of variance. But it's a very, very imperfect tool. It's a better than nothing type tool because it's just very hard to accurately compute uh, variance. Now, you might say, OK, well, I get that autocorrelation, autoregressive behavior is going to be a big problem. But how do I actually correct for that? And well, the first step is knowing that it's there. You got to test for it. And then you got to build that into your model. Because at the end of the day, if there's a property going on in your system, you need to know about that property and have it be in your model. And then that way, your errors, your residuals, ideally will be not autocorrelated because your model will have accounted for all of the autocorrelation in, in your data set. 
So, you know, you can test for the behavior. And in general, kind of the kth order autocorrelation, which is what we're going to talk about when we're testing, is defined as, as follows, which is just the covariance between x sub t and the covariance between x sub t minus k. So the covariance between a data point and the data point k before that is defined as this, which is really just, again, we're going back to correlation. So if you go over the correlation in the lecture series, it's just covariance normalized by standard deviation. Basically, it's counting like, how much autocorrelation is there between a data point and the data point k before. So the, kind of the kth lag is oftentimes how you'll hear it referred to, or the nth lag, or whatever the letter is you're using to refer to it. So oftentimes what you'll do is you'll go to these autocorrelation functions, which actually just compute all the correlations for you know up to n lags. In this case, we're looking at 40 lags. And we're computing the ACF and the PACF. They're just slightly different metrics. And we're going to look at both uh, just because they're going to give us some more information. If you're interested in learning more, I recommend Googling, going to Wikipedia. But just for now, we're going to be using both the ACF and the PACF. And we're going to try to be learning as much as we can from both of them. So the first thing is obviously like, it's hard sometimes to read these numbers all. So let's look at them on a plot. And OK. So certainly looks like we have decaying memory in the system. And this is the ACF. And there's something weird going on, right? Which is you're seeing, well, that's the zeroth element. So it's covariance with its zeroth lag, which is always going to be 1, right? So it's just how correlated is something with itself, well, 1. And then for this first one, you see some autocorrelation and then a little more, and then a lot of autocorrelation. And then the same pattern just repeats itself. And this is a very clean laboratory example that we've run on our data here. And in practice, what you're looking at here is basically just harmonic structure. So in practice, because, like I said, the dependence echoes, right? So if you have kind of a structure where you have high dependence to one or two or three lags into the past that will echo, right? And you'll have this periodicity of the dependence going back through your data. So this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing this, this echoing, also known as harmonic structure, because you'll see it at integer multiples of your initial lags. So that's what we're seeing here. And then the, the PACF, while you can see here, it's actually giving us probably a little bit more useful information in this case, which is saying, Here's our autocorrelation dependencies. And uh, I believe I may have misread earlier. I think that it's actually reversed. So you have the strongest autocorrelation three lags into the past. But that's what you see here. And the rest of it you can see is kind of, well, it's near zero. But so far, everything we've done has been kind of non rigorous, right? Because we've just kind of eyeballed it. So let's actually put some more rigor into it. And let's compute confidence intervals around our autocorrelations. Now, in practice, obviously, like I said, confidence intervals are going to be incorrect when you're looking at autocorrelated data. But the confidence intervals that are computed by the ACF and PACF in the statistical tests, like the way that they try to do it tries to take into account this fact. So ideally, they'll give us a better idea of you know which things we should be more confident in. So we just plot them here. And this plot basically says that everything is significantly above uh, zero autocorrelation. And then this plot says, well, the first three are significantly above zero autocorrelation. The bottom ends of our confidence intervals are above zero. And then the rest of these, like most of them are not significantly statistically different from zero. You've got a few here that pop out. But you know, if you're sampling many times, you would expect a few to pop out of your of your confidence intervals. So what we say here is, hmm, well, you know, I don't think it's likely that we'd have a lag at, you know, one, two, and three, and then randomly another lag at twenty, another lag at twenty six, and another lag at thirty seven. Maybe, but that's probably just like harmonic structure. That's probably just echoes. But really what this is telling us is like, look, there's there's a dependency on the on the previous three, and then the rest of them probably not worth as much effort. So we say, OK, great. So let's actually try to fit a model to our data. And we're going to construct a model just using a default time series function. And we're going to fit it. 
And uh, the model actually doesn't know how many parameters it should have. We're not forcing it to be a certain number of parameters. And it's just a simple autoregressive model, just like the ones we showed earlier in the lecture. And then here's the parameters that it estimated based on the fit. And you can see here it actually has values. We'll just plot them out for pretty much everything in you know, up to 20 lags, which is not good, right? Because we know there's only three actual lags. So why did our model give us parameters for all these different lags, right? And you can see here it is giving it is getting that third lag, which is important. So you know that's good. That's getting that third lag. But then it's also you know saying that it's going to give you a parameter for this lag and this lag, like all the lags. And the standard error around the parameters some of the time is not crossing zero. You can see here this was like this parameter is not significantly different from zero according to standard error. This parameter is not significantly different from zero. But this one is. This one is. This one is. This one is. This one is, etc. So like a lot of the time it is saying that the parameter is, you know, there's good evidence that this parameter should be a real parameter. So in practice, what you need to do is model validation on this type of thing. So models will often choose too many lags because of, you know, that echoing I talked about, you know, randomness in your data of noise. And, you know, you always want a low parameter number in your model to avoid overfitting. So we're going to use two information criterion called AIC and BIC. AIC is a khaki information criterion, and, and BIC is Bayes information criterion. And really what they're trying to get at is like take a model and penalize it for having more parameters, assuming that two models, that have one has more parameters, but they both explain the same amount of information. So it kind of tries to normalize by the amount of information that it's explaining, and then penalize for having more parameters. So there's, there's information criterion, and they're used for model selection. And really what these criterion are trying to get at is that you can apply them to a bunch of different models and then take the relative likelihood of each model and then select the one that has the highest relative likelihood. And keep in mind that you know we're not necessarily making claims about the absolute likelihood that models are, are, are correct here. We're just trying to choose the best one. And again, because of p-hacking and multiple comparisons bias, that lecture, you, you'll know that if we have like 20 models and we try to pick the most likely one, even using an information criterion, we're back to our original problem of overfitting. We've tried a ton of tests, and uh, at the end of the day, we're going to pick the best one, and, and that's likely to be overfit. So in general, when you're using information criterion, I would say still try to you know, limit the number of tests that you're running, the number of candidate models that you feed into an information criterion, or make sure you run an out of sample step. Ideally, you always want to run an out of sample step, but the you know best way to not waste that out of sample data, which becomes in sample as soon as you use it, the best way to not waste it is to you know minimize the chances you're overfitting in sample. So, you know, use use as few models as possible when you're running the information criterion. So here. We test 10 different models where we're forcing each model to a different number of maximum lags. And we get the relative likelihood. And you can see here that it thinks that the eight parameter model is the best one using a, a khaki information criterion. OK, so still definitely better than the 20 parameter model that this, uh, this thing spit out. But eight's still a decent amount, and I might be a little uncomfortable with that. So I do some more investigation. One of the other pieces of investigation is let's also use another information criterion. So this one we're using Bayes. In this case, Bayes turns out to be more conservative. And it says that our best model is the three parameter model. And you can see here, I think there's actually a, a typo in the notebook, which I apologize um, for. This is, in this case, uh, it actually said eight, which is the consequence of you know randomness when you run this. It's always going to be a little different. But the Bayes one is actually correct in this case. It correctly got that there were three lags that we put into the, to the data. Now, that said, you know, that doesn't mean it's always going to be correct. So don't you know, take it as gospel. Uh, it just means that the more tools you throw at it, the more information you have, the better decisions you're going to make. So uh, in this case, you know, I tend to like the more conservative estimates between the two because I'm always looking for a way to get rid of parameters. So in this case, I would have chosen the, the three. And I would have said, let's pick the one that has the three lags. And then we're good to go. But again, keep in mind that it's always best to, rather than try a ton of different lags and see what works, because that can lead to overfitting, always try to let your understanding and knowledge of the system drive your construction of your models, if possible. So if you had some knowledge about how many lags 
uh, you would have before then, you know, you use that knowledge. The last step is we're going to evaluate the residuals. So oftentimes a really good step whenever you're doing model validation is to look at the residuals, the difference between the forecasted and the uh, actual historical data. Like if you took your model and used it over the past to forecast or over your in-sample data to forecast, how it would have done and then how, what, you know, what predictions it would have made and then what actually happened. The difference between the two being the error, also known as the residuals. Basically, what you can do is you can look at that and you want very little structure to be in your residuals because if there's structure in your residuals, it means that you're leaving information on the table. Your model isn't explaining everything. And so here we're going to use that max lag of three, the three lag AR model to run on our data. And then we're going to look at the residuals and we're going to say, are they normally distributed? And it looks like they are, which is good because remember earlier we saw that autocorrelated data was definitely not normally distributed. It had fat tails. So that's a good case for us. That actually is like, that's, that's, that's promising that this model is explaining a lot of what's going on in the data to the point that the structure of the residuals at the end of the data they are left over with are normal. Now in practice, you want to also probably look at the residuals more in depth. So what I might do is I might actually plot out the residuals, look at how they're, you know, behaving and kind of try to get a sense from there. But, you know, uh, for now, that's a, that's a decent first step and, and certainly is, is comforting. Um, so in general, uh, like I said, autocorrelation um, can be a huge problem because it, you know, negates estimations of variance and, and p-values and really makes it hard to interpret anything from your analysis and can be pretty invisible unless you know where to look. So um, be very careful. Try to check for autocorrelated behavior whenever possible um, and try to, you know, model for it and incorporate it into your understanding of the system. Um, and when you're modeling for it, be careful. Like in any other case, do model validation and try to make sure you're not overfitting and you're, you're choosing a model with few parameters. Um, and and if, you're, if you're careful, you should be able to reduce a lot of the, the fat tails and a lot of the tail risks that you would otherwise see and also just have better confidence in your predictions overall. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, and uh, you know we'll, we'll probably discuss more about autocorrelated models um, or autoregressive models in the future. And, and we'll probably also have more lectures on moving average and ARMA, autoregressive moving average models. If you want to see more, there's currently lectures out on GARCH models. There's a lecture on that. That stands for Generalized Autoregressive Conditionally Heteroscedastic Models, which is a whole fun kettle of fish that I recommend you check out if you're interested. And we actually show an example of a numerical optimization for parameter fitting based on a maximum likelihood function that's closed form. And then we also show generalized method of moments, which is a way to parameter fit on a model that doesn't need a closed form maximum likelihood. And it actually looks at the residuals. So it's a really, it's a cool lecture that gets a lot of the concepts we were discussing today, but more in depth. So I recommend you check it out if you're interested more. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another Quantopian lecture video. I just wanted to say that all the lectures are always freely available at quantopian.com lectures. We also hold workshops around the world. Uh, information on those can be found at quantopian.com workshops. We work with local experts to bring you full day interactive hands-on approaches to learning this stuff and try to focus more on giving you the tools so that you can leave the workshop able to learn more on your own than trying to cover any specific technique. For information on events near you, you can check our events page, also linked from here, and see if there are events coming up nearby that you might be interested in. This also includes meetups and hackathons and all sorts of stuff in addition that we do to try to make education more accessible. Lastly, if there's anything that confused you today, or if you want to start a discussion on the stuff that you learned, please head over to the community forums available under community forums in the menu bar. Post a question, look for other similar questions. In general, it's there to really give you more tools to keep moving forward and not get stuck and continue using the knowledge that you learned in the lecture series. So again, thanks for listening and hopefully I'll see you again soon.